I just want to say good evening to everyone and welcome. Thank you to the Walpole Westwood Dedham League of Women Voters for sponsoring our presentation. My name is Linda Winslow and I am a member of the Walpole League of Women Voters. I'm also a proud retired member of the Massachusetts Nurse Association and I currently serve on the Congress on Nursing Practice. I am pleased to introduce my m and colleagues, Katie Murphy, Karen Coughlin, and Lisa Field. Katie is the president of the Massachusetts Nurses Association, a nurse at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and a member of the Framingham League of Women Voters. Karen is a member of the m and Board of Directors, chair of the m and Political Action Committee, and chair of the m and Workplace Violence Task Force. Lisa Field is an associate director of the m and Division of Legislation and Governmental Affairs. Although we cannot support any particular bill that the League of Women Voters of Mass is not supporting, we thank the m and for offering us this important educational opportunity. Just a reminder that this event is being recorded. If everyone could please mute their microphones, it would be appreciated. We will have time for questions in the end. I'm going to now turn it over to Katie. Thanks very much, Linda. And thank you so much, Walpole Westwood Dedham League of Women Voters for inviting us to talk about our legislative work. Uh, I wanted to just give you a little bit of background about the Massachusetts Nurses Association. We're the third largest nurses union in the United States, and we represent over 23,000 nurses and healthcare professionals in, the health, in 85 healthcare facilities, including 51 acute care hospitals, schools, visiting nurses associations, public health departments, and state agencies such as the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and the Department of Developmental Services. We provide a unique perspective on healthcare issues as we are at the front of the healthcare delivery system providing 90% of the clinical care patients receive. It has been almost two full years of being in a once in a lifetime unprecedented health emergency. The MNA was the, in the forefront of sounding the alarm about the lack of personal protective equipment and the need to have the standard of infection control, a single use N95 mask for every frontline healthcare worker. We advocated for access for testing for both healthcare staff and patients and patient loads have been as high and never have been as this high in terms of numbers of patients to a nurse and in terms of acuity. In other words, how sick the patient has been. It truly has been a time like never before. COVID has certainly had an impact on healthcare workers. During the first surge, nurses had a higher, the highest percentage of US healthcare worker COVID associated hospitalizations. And here's another sobering and tragic statistics. Nurses have the highest percentage of COVID deaths by occupation. There are a couple of pieces of legislation that address these issues that our members experienced at the bedside. Far too often, healthcare workers didn't have the proper PPE, contracted COVID, and were told by their employer that you must have gotten it in the community. Occupational presumption makes the presumption that frontline healthcare workers contracted COVID in the course of providing patient care. Healthcare workers, healthcare worker notification would require that healthcare employers notify a frontline worker of a COVID exposure. Not the law right now. PPE transparency and availability would ensure transparency and reporting of available PPE, and it would create an, an PPE oversight committee. As our COVID-19 numbers continue to rise and new variants emerge, these three bills are important to protect our frontline healthcare workers. I'm gonna now turn this over to Lisa. Lisa. Thanks, Katie. An important priority of the m and is legislation addressing essential services. Since 2009, we have seen 40 unit or hospital closures across the state. In 2020 alone and during a pandemic, a half dozen units either were closed or were proposed for closure. These range from intensive care units to medical surgical units to a maternal health unit to inpatient behavioral health beds. 
The elimination of these services has a profound negative effect on the care of patients in these communities and puts a strain on other already burdened health systems. These closures have created a dearth of maternity and behavioral health beds in parts of the state. So we wanted just to take a few minutes to do a little deeper dive as to the impact of essential service closures specifically to maternity. This map shows the location of the eight maternity units that have closed in the last 10 years. We put those locations on an overlay of the area deprivation index, which clearly shows that most of the closures have happened in the most economically disadvantaged communities in the state. The elimination of these services has a profound negative effect on the care of these patients in these communities and puts a strain on other already bur burdened healthcare systems. For example, in the last four years, Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton has absorbed patients from two closures, Morton Hospital in Taunton and the unexpected closure of Norwood Hospital. In Taunton, women unable to access hospital maternity care close to home have actually given birth in Morton Hospital's emergency room or en route to Good Samaritan Hospital. We have had also had child and adolescent behavioral health beds closed while the boarding of these patients in our emergency rooms have dramatically increased. We have had intensive care units temporarily closed during a public health emergency in which the state was allowing hospitals to actually temporarily expand their ICU capacity. Two sets of bills have been filed. Senate Bill 754, House Bill 1253 would address some of these issues with the current system that seem powerless to stop these closures under ordinary circumstances. We also have another set of bills, Senate Bill 1429 and House Bill 1262, that would halt these closures during a public health emergency. I'm now going to turn it back over to Katie. Thank you so much, Lisa, for that, that really sobering information. You know, COVID's impact on patient care reinforces the importance of the staffing for the best patient outcomes. Poor staffing conditions continue, continue to be a contributing factor on poor patient outcomes. And these conditions didn't start with the COVID pandemic. For years, the hospitals increasingly have used just-in-time staffing models, scheduling barely enough nurses to be able to move patients through a revenue-generating system. This approach maximizes profits and leads to growing executive pay. The hospital industry has been creating the conditions for moral injury among nurses and other healthcare workers. It absolutely fails nurses who are trying to fulfill our professional and moral obligation to provide safe, high quality patient care. Our State of Nursing in Massachusetts survey also shows going back several years the stagnation, the degradation of care and how the pandemic just exacerbated this. 55% of nurses surveyed in the state of nursing in Massachusetts said hospital care was getting worse compared to only 10% who said it was improving. This is a significant acceleration of a trend seen in previous state of nursing in Massachusetts surveys. Since 2014, with only one exception in 2017, more nurses have reported care is getting worse rather than better. This, the, this year, the number of nurses concerned about patient care quality exploded. The Workforce Development Patient Safety Act calls for a series of independent studies to examine the makeup of the current nursing workforce, determine the nursing needs for the Commonwealth over the next several decades, and to provide an independent evidence-based analysis of issues affecting the nursing workforce, including, but not limited to, wor workplace staffing, violence, injuries, and quality of life. The results of these studies would be to determine the path forward in setting safe patient limits for Massachusetts acute care hospitals to ensure optimum patient care. We wanna be very clear. Massachusetts does not have a nursing shortage. We have a high number of nurses per capita and a nursing surplus. What nurse Massachusetts has is a shortage of nurses willing to work at the bedside under the current conditions. Numerous surveys and studies have been done in the past year have, and with most of them finding somewhat around 20% of nurses, one in five, are planning to leave the field in the next few years. Here in Massachusetts, a survey conducted by the MNA found that one third of nurses report that they plan to leave nursing earlier due to their work experience over the past year. 
burnout, high patient loads, PTSD have, been, have only ex been exacerbated with the pandemic. I'd like to turn this over to Karen right now. Thank you so much for having us and thanks, Katie. So I did want to talk about violence in healthcare settings because it is on the rise. The statistics when you hear about them are absolutely staggering. Nurses are assaulted on the job more than police offices and prison guards. Nearly 75% of all workplace assaults occur in healthcare settings and over 70% of hospital <laughs> emergency room nurses report being assaulted during their career. So the problem actually is likely worse than these statistics that I've given you, as there is little to no data collection of standardized reporting of workplace violence in healthcare settings. Furthermore, the victims of workplace violence in medical settings underreport these incidences, which has been shown to be just 30% of nurses and 26% of doctors report incidents. We do have some bills related to workplace violence. Senate Bill number 1605 and House Bill 2465 would require healthcare employers to perform an annual assessment or safety risk assessment. And based on those findings, they would then have to develop and implement programs to minimize the danger of workplace violence to employees and patients. It would also provide time off for healthcare workers assaulted on the job to address legal issues and to reduce semi-annual and to require, not reduce, require semi-annual reporting of assaults on healthcare employees. We also have two mental health bills that were filed by Senator Mark Pacheco and Representative Patricia Haddad, um, Senate 1301 and House 2098 would create two intensive stabilization and treatment units within the Department of Mental Health, one for males and one for females. Under this bill, patients who exhibit um, extreme aggression, highly assaultive behavior and or self-destructive behavior could be a combination of all three actually, would be committed to a specialized unit. In order to protect all patients and staff, these particular units would be physically separate, highly secure, and would be structured environments with specially trained staff. The second bill is about the issue of patients with acute mental illness, boarding for days or sometimes even weeks in our emergencies um, rooms across our hospitals in the state. This leaves these patients languishing without care and it impacts staff ability to provide care to other patients in the emergency department requiring emergency medical care. Um, this bill would create a pilot program at Taunton State Hospital to transfer medically stable, high acuity behavioral health patients or those with a dual diagnosis, which means they have a substance use disorder and they suffer from the challenges of a mental illness. Um, so it would move them away um, from overcrowded emergency departments until such time that an appropriate placement is found to meet the patient's needs. Um, we're happy to report that a modified version of the pilot program has been included in the mental health bill that was recently passed by the Senate and we're going to follow those developments very closely. Um, so I'm gonna turn that back to, to Linda right now, Linda Winslow, our host. Well, I would like to say thank you so much to our speakers and our participants and everyone that helped me um, put this together. And please check out the m as website or follow the m a on social media. Any questions? I was wondering if the problem with um, nurse, nurses staffing in the hospitals, um, is there a difference between for-profit hospitals and not-for-profit hospitals in that regard? No? No, there is not. <laughs> Surprising so. No, there is not. It all depends oh. on it. I, in, 
I mean, years ago, we used to take a look at hospitals and we would take a look at these small little hospitals that are within our communities and think, oh, it's our community hospital, this is our hospital. Um, despite the designation, all hospitals pretty much um, are for profit, whether they are listed as nonprofit or not. Yes. Um, we are seeing issues with staffing across all hospitals. It doesn't matter if they are for profit or not for profit. Um, and it's been an ongoing issue. It's not a new issue. Unfortunately, I would say that it has increased during the pandemic um, because we have seen nurses who um, are no longer willing um, to work under the conditions that, um, that are out there right now. And so you are seeing an, ex an exodus from the workforce of nurses who are retiring early or they are going to other, um, areas of nursing where they don't have to be at the bedside, unfortunately. And we're also seeing some nurses, especially some of the younger nurses who have entered the field, um, leaving their positions to go and work for travel agencies throughout the country during the pandemic for um, higher amounts of pay. I mean, it is funny because today I just read an article where the Kentucky governor um, declared a state of emergency because he said there was a nursing shortage in Kentucky. And so in all honesty, um, this is something that has been created by the hospital industry. Um, and now, unfortunately, it's come back to roost. They have traditionally been um, using a lean model with their staffing for a number of years. And nurses are no longer willing to work under these conditions. So it's not that there's particularly a nursing shortage throughout the country and probably even within Kentucky. Um, and you'll see a number of hospitals now, if what they're doing is they're trying to incentivize nurses uh, to come to the bedside by throwing money at us. And nurses are sick of that because no amount of money um, can place um, a price on the need for a nurse to provide the care to our patients that we were trained to do. And I think that's what it's come down to. I have a two part question. Um, I have heard repeatedly about the increase in um, cases of mental health with our young people. And I know, especially in our area, we don't have Westwood Lodge, we don't have Norwood Hospital. Um, and I know before the pandemic, there was this ex extreme shortage of available beds. And what is the situation now? So, I mean, I, I'm a seasoned, I'd like to say seasoned. <laughs> mental health, psychiatric mental health nurse. So I worked for well over 34 years for the Department of Mental Health. And I was the um, vice chair for the state chapter of healthcare professionals who work within DPH, DMH, et cetera. And I have served on a couple of legislative committees to take a look at mental health access um, throughout the state. And what I would say is that some of those places um, that have closed, um, it's because the care there was horrendous. And for instance, Westwood Lodge. Yes. Um, some of these mental health facilities are being run by large corporations um, that are based out of the state who have never um, provided the staffing that the patients deserve and require in order to provide the care that is needed for them. So they then therefore say, and they pay horrendous, they pay is, the pay is horrendous. They place, the workload is horrendous. The, um, what, the, what they will then do is they may be licensed under the state and the Department of Mental Health for 120 beds, but they'll only fill 60. And um, so those are some of the things I will say that the, um, Massachusetts Health and Hospital Association just last week came out that they had done a survey of their own hospitals that found um, that with um, 
while COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in a sharp uptick of needing behavioral health services, hospitals have been forced, they say, to reduce the number of inpatient beds available to treat those patients. So they say that much of the problem has to do with lack of staffing, but they've never staffed their facilities the way that they should. Um, but there, there were 362 psychiatric beds taken offline, the Health and Hospital Association has said. Um, given all that, how do, since you are talking to us about legislation, is there a legislative fix for that? And what if you are a person out there, God forbid, who has a child who is suffering from a mental health issue, what do you do? And, you know, you talked to us about safety, but, you know, that child many times has to be removed from the home, from the community. Um, where does the child go? The emergency you know that, room? You know, that, well, you know, when, thanks, Marsha, for, um, for that important question, because if that child does go to an emergency room, sometimes, as Karen had pointed out, they are in that emergency room, not only for days, but for yeah. weeks. Again, and, that, and that's the um, foundation of our essential services legislation. And in the bill, we say, you know, there, there's more, puts more teeth in enforcement of, you know, you can't close these beds. And if you need um, a bed for a child or an adolescent in one part of the state, as Lisa pointed out with that map, the closest one could be, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50 miles away. And if you yeah. don't have transportation, it could, might as well be in another country, you know, and, and just to, you know, also point out another aspect that we're looking at very closely is that there really has been a sharp uptake in um, behavioral health issues in kids suffering through, you know, doing remote learning and being at home. And so now they're back in the school buildings and the school nurses, instead of addressing some of these issues, you know, meeting with the kids, maybe making a plan, talking with the parents, you know, dealing with the issues of kids coming back to school with the mental health issues, all they're doing is COVID tracing. Again, because municipalities over the past couple of decades have decimated their public health departments. And I think this is happening in every single municipality across the Commonwealth that kids are going to school and they're just not receiving the services that they are used to because the nurses are being used as public health. They're spending time swabbing patients, data entry, um, contact tracing, making phone calls to people and that all of their contacts of the children in the building as well as the adults. So, and that is, that's not it being addressed by our, our essential services bill, but it's certainly something we are trying to get the Commonwealth to act on as well. But I know you would ask the question about where do these kids go? And emergency room. Right. Um, and part of that, um, you talked a great deal about the, the uptick in violence um, when you're performing your services. And I was curious as to how much of that has been due to the epidemic and or the attitude about it, that because you're a healthcare worker, you can do something miraculously. So, I mean, I would say that you know, my colleagues and I, we have been talking about, um, you know, trauma and PTSD that our frontline healthcare workers have been um, faced with over the last year of COVID. But unfortunately, trauma and PTSD um, in the nursing field, it's not something that is unfamiliar to nurses before the pandemic. And I would say when the pandemic did hit, yes, we have seen increased violence directed at healthcare workers, um, which actually shouldn't be surprising because often um, violence often escalates during emergencies. Um, and our frontline healthcare workers, um, they were often put in the position of enforcing strict um, COVID visitor policies and mask mandates and um, 
these situations sometimes did escalate to violence and we're just now starting to see some research and data beginning to emerge on this. But it is, um, I would say even before the pandemic though, the incidences of violence in healthcare settings were absolutely alarming. Because even though um, employees in the healthcare sector across the United States, um, you know, in social assistance sector, you know, accounts for 12.2% of the working profession. But out of that 12.2% of the workforce who are in the, you know, this, 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 these professions, we represent nearly 75% of workplace violence assaults. Um, that's where they occur in a healthcare setting. And, and I would say also that, you know, it's, it can be very difficult um, because nurses have a tendency, um, unfortunately, you know, some hospitals are okay in their response um, to healthcare workers when they're assaulted, but often and many times we find there is very little support for uh, healthcare workers when they are assaulted. Um, oftentimes nurses will report that the first question that is asked of them from their administration is what did you do to cause this? Um, you know, and I would say as there are more patients to care for, um, it makes it very difficult. Nurses have for a number of years been struggling to provide the care that is needed and they are having to make decisions in the moment as to which patient that they respond to first, whether that's a patient who requires help getting out of bed or someone who is having trouble breathing or someone whose EKG monitor perhaps is going off or an alarm is buzzing. Um, so these are the types of um, situations that nurses have been placed under and all of those situations arise to an increase in workplace violence. So, I mean, we do have this legislation. I think the very first thing we need to do is we, we do need to, you know, hus the hospital industry itself is actually acknowledging that it is um, a problem. Um, the Joint Commission um, who comes and accredits our hospitals across the country also now recognizes this and they um, have acknowledged that where once um, hospitals were looked upon as, you know, institutions of caring um, are now um, you know, steadily, seeing steadily increasing rates of violence, um, including, you know, assaults and rapes and even homicides. And oftentimes there isn't much attention paid to it until something horrific happens in a hospital setting. And that's when the public says, what is, you know, oh my God, how did this happen? And the nurses are like, where have you been? Because this is, this is what we've been dealing with, you know? So I think at times the nurses are the canaries in the coal mine. Um, and I think now people are starting to listen and hopefully there'll be some redress because, um, appropriate responses to workplace violence, um, it helps everyone because it's not just the healthcare worker who's assaulted who's traumatized, it's those workers who have witnessed the trauma, it's patients who have witnessed the trauma. Um, you know, workplace violence affects everyone, families um, of those assaulted. Um, it is and can be a life-changing event. Um, and I think, you know, we're starting and I'm hoping um, that our legislation will move forward to help those people who do get assaulted on the job. Linda, I have a question. This is Lisa Compagnoni. Hey, Lisa, go for it. <laughs> thank you. Ladies, thank you so much for your presentation. And as Linda, I am also among you, a very proud retired nurse of 45 years my entire experience is in the city of Boston. And I would like to ask, I was not aware that so many nurses have been affected by COVID. I would like to ask, what is their progress? How are they doing? And what are the actual numbers with our nursing force in Massachusetts? Thank you, uh, thank you, and uh, that's that's wonderful that you uh, are are in our wonderful profession. 
Um, Indeed. You know what, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, hospitals don't necessarily keep these statistics. They're, they're starting to. I, I know I'm seeing greater numbers. I, I, and I'm not sure whether it's the variant. I think certain amount of it is people going back to schools, um, getting it from, you know, out in the community. Certainly after Thanksgiving, we saw a surge. So um, fortunately we have um, in the Massachusetts Nurses Association, well over 90% vaccination rate. So while our nurses are getting sick, very few of them are being hospitalized, but they're out of work, some of them for weeks, which is even further affecting the number of nurses at the bedside. When we are, our patients are so much sicker, you know, we, they're, and, and they're, and they're all on isolation, not all, but I mean, all the COVID patients are. So you have to get dressed up um, each and every time you go in the room. So losing one nurse on that shift can be significant. So, um, you know, I, I think we're seeing an uptick in numbers right now, but not being hospitalized. And I would also say that for those nurses who have been working specifically with COVID patients, um, we have seen a lot of reach out to our organization um, for them related to self-care and what can we do to help provide um, these nurses and healthcare workers um, with self-care. And so we've done a lot of um, things on that front. We have it on our website. We have um, had um, been lucky to have had volunteer, um, volunteer psychological services for many of our members who have been willing to provide counseling, um, et cetera. And, um, you know, we have a lot of nurses who, you know, they're just feeling at this point kind of beaten down. Um, they had hoped that they were, you know, I, I would say probably, you know, towards the end of the spring when the vaccines came out and people were getting vaccinated, our nurses were thinking, oh my God, thank God, there was, there was light at the end of the tunnel. And then we got another surge. We got another surge. Now we're dealing with another surge. And so I think, you know, people forget that our nurses, they're like, well, this is what you signed up for. This is what you get paid for. This is your job. You know, it's taken a toll on our workforce. And, you know, they just want people to get vaccinated and get their boosters and let's put an end to this. I mean, because um, they just don't want to do it anymore. They just don't want to do it anymore. And, and I think if I might just add to that, you know, a, a big concern, and I think uh, we are starting to see it in the press as well as we're saying, what about our other sick patients? Because we have other sick patients, right? Who have um, malignancies or they had a heart attack or they've got a pneumonia and they need these hospital beds as well. So, you know, just what Karen said, we want everyone to be vaccinated. We are seeing, you know, a certain percentage of vaccinated people who are immunocompromised, they're coming in, but a lot of these beds are the unvaccinated and, and some of them are remarkably young, remarkably young. And we, you just, and, and that's where it's, you know, we say, you know, we have 20 beds, but we really have 40 patients that we need to put in those beds. How are we going to do that? And I think that, that when you were talking about, um, the counseling, that's often what nurses have to kind of uh, deal with and figure out what to do with the, those concerns that we're having. I just really, um, you know, I'm Emmy Bailum, I'm an infectious disease physician, and I just really want to thank the Mass Nursing Association. Um, in December, the hospital I work with, um, of December 2020, we finally had testing of employees. And part of my time, I actually do research. And so at the universities are getting tested twice a week, once a week, MIT has like a 0.5% rate, you know, because everyone's tested, they have this amazing system. And yet the hospital employees were not being tested. And the nurses kind of test, this is like the silent, this is like the secret. 
that we're not allowed to be tested because we, we can't get we can't get sick or we can't know that we're sick and we have to go back to work because we don't have enough people to do it. And then this was like a real complaint of the nurses. And I have to say, even through the, those first few months, I'm kind of wearing my N95 and nurses like, can I get an N95? You know, so I said, you know, I had to go to our infection control and say, and I'm not in charge. So that's, you know, I'm not the making the decisions. I'm just like a worker bee. And I said, can each nurse not get one N95? You know, and now we obviously have renewables, but this advocacy and we're wearing gowns for MRSA and like, who cares about MRSA? Get the gowns for, you know, the contagious patients. But I, it was the Mass Nurses Association that forced all the Boston hospitals to force them to have hospital testing. And that took till December. And I must applaud the Mass Nursing Association because I knew where it was coming from. And it wasn't coming, the nurses in the hospital really, you know, you're kind of, you're, I don't know what happens in the hospital. You get shamed, you get intimidated, you get threatened. And, you know, it really had to come from outside. And I just can only, I can't tell you, like, you guys rock, you know, like you really did the right thing and you really have been advocating for all the right things. And, um, and it's tough. And everything you said about the nurses burning out is so true. And I can only um, agree with that. And the only thing I can sort of read about kind of a commentary, I think I, I actually wrote to somebody who today had 54 patients to see. Can you imagine seeing 54 patients in a clinic in one day? I said, I said, uh, uh, we're, we're experiencing a lot of the same things, delayed diagnosis, cancer, uncontrolled diabetes, and their sequelae, delayed elective surgeries, and still COVID. ICUs are still full. Patients are sicker than ever. The hospitals are now, of course, now the safest places they've ever been, and mask hand washings, ABCs, and we're all vaccinated or, or will be fired here in Massachusetts with the medical staff shortages. It's a lot of work. And the only thing I can note is there's been a logarithmic growth in expensive hospital administrators that albatross patient care. Thank you very much. I just have to really say I wrote that text today because, you know, it's it's tiresome. Right. And um, and the hospitals and administration really haven't been the kind of support that we would wish they were. And, but, I, you know, that's why you join something like the league and you have to do legislation. Right. Thank you for your advocacy. Sounds like you're on the front lines. And you know what, that, that's interesting. I really forgot about that from a year ago. And I remember that now that you bring that up. You know, it's, it's, been, it's been a fast year, but boy, thank you very much. And, you know, right, exactly. I mean, right, the league is such a, you know, such a, a strong, powerful voice on so many issues, you know, and that's what we're attempting to do as well. If we as individuals wanted to send a prod to our representative or our uh, whatever, what would be the most important bills that we should support? Could you tell us the numbers and the names of the bills again? You know, the, the, you know we, we filed probably about 21 bills, but our, our priorities this year are the um, COVID presumption, which is, you know, a couple of bills. And actually, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but we can certainly, we can get them to Linda and get them. Hold on. Um, oh, I got the numbers. Oh, I, the actually, numbers. I, I forget, at least is here. I got them. And yeah, then, so the presumption um, bill is, S, the pres presumption bill is the Senate 1194. Okay. Uh, yep, yeah, 71194 and the House, I think is 1203. But if you do Senate 1194. House is Senator 2031. 2031. House is 2031. In the, the Senate, the, the main sponsor on the Senate side is Senator Feeney, who I know as many of you, if you're from Walpole, I think yep. is your senator, Senator Feeney. Uh, what, do you, what else do you think? Essential and, services? Then essential services, again, which is the closure of beds, units, hospitals, you know, um, 
you know, an example was tenant, uh, a for-profit corporation, you know, that we're fighting with in Worcester, but they own also Metro Western Framing in Natick, the Leonard Morse campus. And actually they were going to close, they were slated to close and DPH for once put their foot down and said, absolutely, you are not closing acute care beds during a pandemic, which was <laughs> good to see, you know, they yeah. have since closed. But um, so essential services, you know, again. And, uh, and that one is Senate number 1429 and House 1262. And the sponsors are Senator Jamie Eldridge and Representative uh, Patricia Duffy. Linda, can I ask you to make a nice, clean, short email that goes out to all of the members just not to these people here and yes, tell yes. them how easy it is just to call and leave the message and no one's going to quiz them or debate them or annoy them. Right. <laughs> well, that will be my job. <laughs> and, 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 yes. and, and you know what, and you're exact. And I, I know, you know, that, you know, that they're um, eager to hear from constituents um, there are actually these bills and the, and the last one that Karen had talked about workplace violence, um, Senator Timothy, who will be, I mean, he and uh, Senator Feeney are kind of changing communities, you know, with the redistricting going forward, but he's the lead sponsor in the Senator, Senate um, of the workplace violence bill. And it feels like there is a lot of support. And again, so that, you know, they get a phone call saying, you know, I need you to support this. It's important to me. Um, it goes a long way. I, you know what? I, it really does. Now, do you have the numbers for workplace violence? Yeah, it's Senate 1605 and House 2465. And if I might ask a question myself, because a lot of our, our participants are residents of one of the 22 towns that has been affected by the closure of the Norwood Hospital. Mm -hmm. Could you perhaps, Lisa or Karen or Katie, give mm -hmm. us a little update? I mean, I had the update, but it's always good to hear it from the foremost authority. And, um, you know, you hear rumors and I want um, the audience to hear the real deal. I mean, Lisa, you can talk about it a little bit in length, but I know the real deal is, is that they're not putting back a maternity unit or a behavioral health unit. That's the real deal. That's steward health is not doing that. Which, yeah. when you take a look at a, a hospital, I mean, in a community, like this is what we need. And Lisa can talk about like, you know, when the closure of beds and the, the domino effect that that has across a region. Right, right. So most definitely, it, it, we need a full service hospital to be back open. And the good news is, is that the Department of Public Health has um, approved the determination of need to rebuild Norwood Hospital. And if you look at the hospitals that have been impacted by Norwood's closure, Good Samaritan has really been in a crisis. They were in a crisis even before Norwood closed. They're getting at the bulk of the emergency room patients are going over to Good Samaritan. Um, as far as maternity goes, they have made an. It, it was not as part, it was not part of the determination of need petition, so maternity will not be reopened. Um, there, what we're hearing pushback from some of the po politicians when we're con when we've been contacting the state legislators, the state legislators are saying back that they're hearing from. Um, both steward healthcare system as well as the Department of Public Health that women have other options. I mean, we can we dispute that from the MA from our point of view is that we've already had so many closures. And again, with Norwood not reopening, it puts another impact within this within this entire region. Not every woman has a Blue Cross Blue Shield insurance card and a great car that can get to one of the Boston hospitals. And in turn, when you look at the impact in the Boston hospitals, they certainly have absorbed a lot of the closures as it is. When you look at the Brigham, you look at Tufts, you look at BMC. 
you know, I think that there's a misnomer. People think, well, you can just go to Boston. Boston itself only has so many beds and so much staffing. They can't absorb everybody is, is the deal. Um, and again, when you look at outcomes, the further a woman has to travel to have a baby, particularly if she has um, underlying conditions, particularly women from our black brown communities, the further that they go, the poorer the outcomes, both for themselves and for their child. Um, so we definitely need to have a little bit of pressure in regards to that, th this whole attitude to change people's attitudes that, you know, oh, women can just go someplace else to have a baby. Um, the mental health, the behavioral health beds are really concerning to us as an organization. I mean, we've said, I think it was Marsha said before, we definitely do not have enough mental health beds. We're seeing that in our emergency rooms. Our emergency rooms are flooded with uh, mental health patients who are looking for beds. So again, um, you know, there's a lot of talk, maybe that the, the steward company will, will build another behavioral health facility, a standalone facility somewhere in one of the surrounding communities. Again, it's, there, there's not another place to go right now. And that's kind of the, the, we're between a rock and a hard place. We need the beds right now in order to put people now into those beds. So it's difficult. But again, we're very pleased to see that the determination of need was approved. Because again, all those other units, the med surge units, the OR, the emergency room, we definitely need those because Good Samaritan is just drowning. I don't know, Karen, if, or do you want to add anything or Katie? No, I mean, I think, you know, like Lisa had said, we are seeing that. And I mean, you know, well over 25 years, I was in Mansfield. I just recently moved. Um, and I would say when Norwood Hospital closed, um, a friend of mine, her daughter, um, was due like in a week, you know, and no one hospital like closed and she had to go to St. Elizabeth's, but it's not just about going to a specific hospital, like, oh, it's okay because there's a hospital in Boston, you know, like St. Elizabeth's in Brighton. That's not too far of a drive because we have many women who don't have transportation and there isn't public transportation really from Mansfield to St. Elizabeth's. And the other thing is when a maternity unit closes in a hospital, oftentimes other services within that area, catchment area, also dry up because they don't receive their prenatal care because those people who are providing those services go to where they're the, closer to the hospital that they're gonna have referrals to. So prenatal care then dries up. And so now we're having women with high-risk pregnancies who are not receiving any prenatal care. I mean, it, it, it's just horrendous when you take a look at, you know, the, the types of services that have closed and who are those patients that they have been trying to marginalize. It's women and it's those who are in need of mental health services. And I find that astounding and it's a public health crisis. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would just like to say that I think that you know, we will do everything that we can to advocate for um, services for our patients across the Commonwealth, and that would be wraparound services, like from cradle to grave. That's what it should be. That's honestly what it should be, because everyone deserves that kind of care. It shouldn't matter where you live. It shouldn't matter what your, your zip code is related to the type of health care that you receive. It really shouldn't. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't matter whether the service is profitable or not to the hospital. Yep. I'd like to compliment, and my mind is going back in the cobwebs. I remember when Quincy Hospital closed, some of my cousins had their babies at Quincy, many had their babies at Norwood. And Quincy is a city, plus minus about 100,000 people. <laughs> Our two towns are not 100,000 people. And the hospital has not been rejuvenated, nor has the idea of the emergency department being available for emergency situations for all of those residents. And as I'm listening very carefully, and as Emmy, Dr. Emmy was saying, the League of Women Voters banding together and supporting women as nurses for the most part are still very high percent women we really need to rally, especially under the umbrella now of abortion discussions, et cetera, et cetera. And I just find it very, very disheartening. We've worked very hard and 
Beppy and I were a part of the Dedham League for years. I've been on the League for 40 years. And I've been a nurse for such a long time. And it seems that we're treading some of the same issues over and over again. And I think to lose two major hospitals, my sister lives in Norwood, mother of four children. Her children were born at Newton Wellesley, but many times she had to run to the Norwood Hospital. And of course that's not there now, but we're fortunate that we have the Glover Hospital in Needham, which is now part of the VI, of course, going back years. And we have the Faulkner and Newton Wellesley. So we're still protected within a radius of 25 miles. But I think women, we just continue to have to roll up our sleeves and be Rosie the Riveter and just work real, real hard all the time, all the time. So I thank you for bringing up some of these issues. In a way, I wish I were much younger and I had my nursing license rejuvenated, but at age 68, almost 69, I don't think I'm putting the scrubs back on. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to be wearing your scrubs to be advocating, you know, and I don't even have to say that to the league, right? Right? Exactly. You know, a very strong, a very well-respected voice, um, you know, across the Commonwealth, across, I mean, across the nation, right, in, in advocating for issues. You know, when we were coming here, you know, I said, boy, this is a very tough crowd, a very tough crowd, having been involved in the league for years. And I know you know your stuff and you ask the very, very tough questions. And I think that's why the league is held in such high esteem. So, you know, like we're, we're, we're just grateful to be able to, you know, have the conversation and um, kind of get the word out. You just keep on trucking. You too. And unfortunately, we're moving into boutique medical services uh -huh. and not the basic care. And um, those people who can't kind of speak for themselves, what you're saying, the young people who are having the young people themselves. I mean, young, I just keep thinking of the kids with mental health issues. Yep. And, um, you know, when you were talking about what the schools do with counseling, all I can right. think of is Michigan. And, yeah. you know, yeah. for me, yes. yeah. those, those things go yeah. together. Yep. I mean, I will say that as far as the legislature goes, um, some of the monies um, from the American Rescue Plan Act um, will be going um, to help provide more services for those children in our, you know, children in our schools who need it. Um, I know that we had, um, the m &A, we had also made that request um, that we would be able to use some of those monies for our cities and towns in order to get more resources into the schools. So school counselors, maybe more school nurses, et cetera, um, in order to address those issues with our young people. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that there aren't enough adolescent and children mental health beds across the Commonwealth. And we just had the pleasure of, um, you know, children and adolescent um, mental health beds out in Holyoke, um, I believe. And, you know, that was the last one out in the Western part of the state. So it's horrifying that if you have a child with a mental health issue, um, that they can't be treated in the community in which they live. If you had a child with diabetes, because oftentimes type one, as many nurses know, Lisa, I'm sure you, you know this, you know, that, you know, they're diagnosed at a fairly young age, um, but they get that treatment like right in the community in which they live. But if they have a brain disorder, they cannot. And often, right. don't be mistaken, I mean, they don't even sometimes receive services in Massachusetts. We have children who, um, are, you know, in this Commonwealth who are, being sent to beds in Vermont and New Hampshire and Rhode Island, et cetera, because there are no beds for them here. That being said, there are some new beds coming online, I believe in Cambridge, um, which would be welcome. So um, the more of those services that we can get, the better. Because many times the families of those kids don't have the resources and those are the kids that go to the streets and those are the kids that end up being trafficked, you know, drug, whatever. I wanted to say, I know Linda was concerned about the methadone mile. 
And on a positive note, the mayor of Boston is doing something. Is anybody yeah. else aware of that? I was yeah. like so excited that she went into that situation. I don't know about anybody else. Linda, I know you were concerned. Right, well, I, I did hear that they were making some, um, some, I guess they would be called tents, but they're housing on the grounds of the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital. I don't know if the MA heard of anything about that. So they're not really grounds at Lemuel Shattuck. Lemuel Shattuck Hospital is um, directly across the street from BMC, Boston Medical oh. Center. So it's right oh, okay. on the Fedone Mile. So oh, I see. there are tents and they have been looking to um, for housing options and also see if they can, you know, fit, um, you know, people with services that they need. So, I mean, it's going to be a multi-pronged approach, I think. And, you know, I think right now, you know, she's got some great ideas, but it's a matter of being able to um, get that through. So is there. Am I mistaken? Is there is there property in Forest Hills that was part of Lemuel Shattuck? It's to make a play. Oh, so oh you know what I was thinking of? Yeah. So you're thinking I was you were thinking of Lemuel Shattuck. They they are there are some um, plans potentially for the Lemuel Shattuck. Lemuel Shattuck is actually in a couple of years they're going to be moving, and so what they're going to you know I think um, DCAM you know throughout the state, they're looking to renovate that, um, the buildings at the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital and the psychiatric services there are looking to move onto um, unused space at Boston Medical Center. What I was thinking about was across the street is we have um, Solomon Catafola Mental Health Center is right. Oh, okay. Yeah. But Lemuel Shattuck, yes, there are some plans or some questions of potential plans. Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually a really another there. issue of more loss of inpatient beds, because most of the closer to the BMC, it's mostly outpatient with a little bit of inpatient. And, and there was actually comments about being residential or, you know, becoming being sold, you know, for more housing development, you know, so I think the concept of where to put the homeless would be a really useful thing about that Jamaica Plain issue, kind of low income. Mm -hmm. And, and or mental health, it still has to do with the actually decreasing the number of inpatient beds again. Right. And also the on the other issue of the pediatric adolescent beds, I did hear, well, I heard it on television and I haven't heard much more about it since, is that Children's Hospital has purchased the Franciscan Children's Hospital and Rehab Center in Brighton, which is right across the street from Brighton High School, right around the corner from St. Elizabeth's. And they, I know, I worked there many years ago and they had a behavioral unit, but not to the scale of what we have now. I mean, it was young children. I mean, you know, like preschoolers and, you know, as they started to, get older, we had to, you know, they had like a day school there, but I think it would be a good, a good situation, but I don't know how many beds they could get in there in terms of, um, you know, psych beds. But I did have a family friend and her daughter, who's a sophomore in high school, she was treated there and the, her outcome is, it's still precarious, but she's still a lot better than where she was when she went in there. So that's one light at the end of the tunnel, I guess. Yes. You know, a lot of our work is focused on listening to the experts, you know, listening to the nurses, listening to the mental health professionals at the bedside on the front lines, rather than those interested in maximizing profit. Because it seems like the, the focus is in the wrong place. And this is talking about the issues at Mass and Cass, about housing, about homeless issues, about children's behavioral health. I mean, I think it's time to listen to the experts and come up with you know, a, a really human plan that may not maximize profits, but it will set us on the right course. Richard, did you have a question? Just uh, if I could real quick, uh, I wanted to make a comment, two comments. One is a uh, great program as noted, 
Uh, I think you should do more of these. Uh, I think if you can, uh, education is the key, Katie. I think you need to get the message out to your constituents and not just focus on the rep representatives and senators, which of course I know you have to influence, but I think it, it or the ground support, get the, uh, mm -hmm. get the average citizen involved, let them know. Of course, I'm prejudiced, as you know, some of you know that, but I mean, <laughs> that aside, the average official like myself, an elected official responds to constituents. And mm -hmm. if enough people are beating down the door or ringing my phone and telling me, hey, Richard, do something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to listen carefully. I'm not going to do it, but I'm going to listen carefully. I will Such tell you, too, on my own part, with all modesty, mm -hmm. I contacted, I think it was Mr. Sherman Loans, if I got his name right, from DPU, for the Department of DPU, Sherman, he was DPH. a commissioner yep. concerning yep. a NORCAP closing this yep. summer. And I yep. wrote on your behalf, and on my own behalf, I was concerned as a commissioner of the closing of that institution and what it would affect the region. Mm -hmm. And he received my letter very well, with all due respect. And, you know, again, it, I'm not in the level of a state rep or a state senator, but I'm still one part of the cog. And I, what I'm trying to right. tell you is the more people you have on that wheel, the better off you're going to be. So anything I can do, obviously, I'll support you. But I think this is a great job tonight, and hopefully you'll keep that, keep that message going. And, of course, best wishes for the holiday, everybody. Take care. Yeah. Great, great suggestion. Great. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Get the word out. Thanks, Richard. You bet. Any other questions or comments that anyone would like to make before we wrap it up? Thank you for waking us up. <laughs> thank you. And, yes, thanks everyone. And Karen and Lisa and Katie, again, I can't thank you enough. And also Tamara for helping me navigate this and Lisa and Katie and Karen for giving me a script and all that. And I will definitely be in touch with um, you again. And maybe something else will come up that we need to put in the forefront and right. we can get more participants and get educated more. Great uh, job, Linda. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Have thank a nice holiday. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Happy you. holidays, everyone. Stay safe. Be festive. Yeah. <laughs>